From New York, this is Democracy Now! To read the statements from President Biden and Secretary Blinken, General Austin, and leaders of both parties, you'd hardly know Palestinians existed at all. Toll from the Israeli assault on Gaza has reached 119, including 31 Palestinian children. But the United States is refusing to push Israel to halt its attack. We'll hear a moving speech from the first Palestinian American woman elected to Congress, Rashida Tlaib, then to the West Bank to speak with longtime Palestinian diplomat and politician Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. We are under occupation. We do not control our borders, our pressing, uh, crossing points, entrance and exit. Israel controls everything. Plus, we speak to Palestinian historian Professor Rashid Khalidi. What's been going on in the last few days uh, in Palestine and Israel is rooted in, in historical issues. Uh, the dispossessions of 1948 uh, are at the root of the dispute. Sheikh Jarrah, uh, Palestinian property, was taken then, and the Palestinian owners can't get it back. Similarly, the disturbances in Israeli cities have to do with the historic discrimination against the Palestinians in Israel. And we look at how Republican senators are trying to block one of the nation's most prominent voting rights advocates to head the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. We'll talk to Ben Jealous about the fight over Kristen Clark's confirmation. All that and more coming up. To Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The death toll in Gaza has reached at least 119 as Israel escalates its aerial assault and fires heavy artillery at the besieged territory ahead of a possible ground invasion. Israeli attacks have killed at least 31 Palestinian children, many under the age of 10. Gaza authorities report 40 percent of the victims in the Israeli strikes have been women and children. Residents of Khan Yunis describe huddling in their homes during the Eid al-Fitr holiday as bombs exploded around them. This Eid, we can't enjoy the celebrations because our neighbors got hit. My neighbor and her daughter were killed. We are close. We are like one family. We're very sad. The Israeli forces stole the cheer of Eid from the children. We bought them new clothes, but they didn't wear them. They are terrified and panicked. Over 830 Palestinians have been wounded so far this week, but Gaza's hospital systems are on the verge of collapse as doctors face shortages of medicine and recurring power outages. Many Palestinians in Gaza have been taking shelter in United Nations schools, even as the U.N.'s Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports more than 24 Palestinian schools have been damaged by Israeli strikes. Eight people in Israel have been killed as Hamas continues to fire rockets from Gaza. Israel's rejected calls for a ceasefire. In a video message addressed to Palestinians, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz blamed Hamas for the violence and threatened that, quote, Gaza will burn. They are sacrificing you for their personal interests. If citizens of Israel have to sleep in shelters, then Gaza will burn. There is no other equation. Elsewhere, Israeli authorities have arrested dozens of Arabs living in Israel in an attempt to quell an unprecedented uprising. Many are being held without access to legal counsel. Jewish mobs have been filmed attacking Palestinians across Israel on live television. President Joe Biden on Thursday reiterated his support for Israel's military campaign in Gaza, shrugging off concerns over the mounting Palestinian death toll. And, uh... One of the things that uh, I have seen thus far is that uh, um, there has not been a significant overreaction. Biden did not mention Palestine or Palestinians during Thursday's remarks from the White House. The Biden administration's blocked the U.N. Security Council from holding a meeting today on the crisis after twice blocking Security Council statements earlier this week. On Capitol Hill, progressive lawmakers took to the House floor Thursday, urging the Biden administration to pressure Israel into ending the eviction of Palestinians from their homes in occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank and to end the assault on Gaza. After headlines, we'll hear the full speech of Rashida Tlaib, the first Palestinian-American woman elected to Congress. 
Governments around the world reported more than 725,000 new coronavirus infections Thursday, one of the highest daily tolls of the pandemic, led by an ongoing massive outbreak in India, which reported another 4,000 deaths Friday. Indian health officials have announced plans to start using Russia's Sputnik V vaccine. Fewer than 3 percent of India's population of nearly 1.4 billion people is fully vaccinated. Japan has widened its coronavirus emergency to three more prefectures, as hospitals report they're becoming overwhelmed by a devastating fourth wave of infections. A Japanese doctors' union this week has joined calls on the Japanese government to cancel the summer's Olympic Games, as just 1 percent of Japan's population is fully vaccinated. Here in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control says masks and social distancing are no longer required in most social settings for people who've been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. CDC director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said Thursday's recommendations were driven by scientific evidence that vaccinated people are at very low risk of severe COVID and that vaccines play a major role in curbing transmission. Someone who is fully vaccinated can participate in indoor and outdoor activities, large or small, without wearing a mask or physical distancing. If you are fully vaccinated, you can start doing the things that you had stopped doing because of the pandemic. We have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. The CDC says rules requiring masks on public transportation still apply and that people should still mask up in crowded indoor situations. Individual businesses are free to continue masking policies. The CDC's announcement reportedly caught even White House officials by surprise. About half of states, most of them with Republican governors, have already lifted mask mandates. California Governor Gavin Newsom says he'll lift a mask mandate in June, while a Michigan order mandating masks in many cases will remain in effect for now. Hackers have released a trove of internal documents from the Washington, D.C., police in what experts say is the worst such ransomware attack in the United States. The cyber gang, known as Babook, reportedly released the sensitive materials on the dark web after a failed blackmail attempt. The information includes officers' personal data, psychological evaluations and disciplinary records. Some documents also involve intelligence agencies and relate to the January 6th insurrection and the presidential inauguration. This comes a week after another ransomware attack shut down the Colonial Pipeline's fuel supply, triggering shortages and sending gas prices soaring along the East Coast. Media are reporting— Colonial Pipeline paid nearly $5 million in ransom to the hackers in order to restore its disabled computer network. President Biden said Thursday those behind the attack are likely based in Russia, but not believed to be linked to the Russian government. An active-duty Marine officer was arrested Thursday for assaulting federal officers during the deadly January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. In a video of the attack, Christopher Warnagiris is seen helping breach the Capitol building. He faces up to 20 years in prison if convicted. In Michigan, protesters gathered at the state capitol in Lansing before delivering eviction notices to Canadian oil transport company Enbridge after it defied an order from Governor Gretchen Whitmer to shut down its Line 5 pipeline by a Wednesday deadline. Whitmer called Enbridge's actions unlawful and warned the state of Michigan would seize its profits if it continues to operate. The pipeline carries 23 million daily gallons of crude oil and natural gas under the Straits of Mackinac, a fragile waterway connecting Lake Huron in Lake Michigan. Whitmer called the pipeline a ticking time bomb. In Britain, journalists and freedom of speech advocates are sounding the alarm over former Ambassador Craig Murray, sentenced to eight months in prison over his reporting of a Scottish politician's sexual assault trial. A Scottish court said Murray provided details on his blog that could allow people to figure out the identity of witnesses in the sexual assault trial, despite never identifying the individuals himself. Murray's defenders say he's being targeted because he's a whistleblower who's closely covered the case against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. The court is also preventing Murray from traveling to Spain to testify in a case involving the CIA spying on Assange while he lived at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. 
In labor news, McDonald's workers are planning a strike next Wednesday, May 19th, to demand a minimum wage of $15 an hour. On Thursday, the fast food giant announced it's raising wages at company-owned restaurants, but 95 percent of McDonald's branches are franchise locations that are not subject to the salary danger changes. McDonald's worker and union organizer Denisha Babbitt said, quote, McDonald is raising pay for some of us and using fancy math tricks to gloss over the fact that they're selling most of us short. We want we won't stop fighting, striking and marching in the streets until we win fifteen dollars and a union for all, they said. And Thursday marked the 36th anniversary of the Philadelphia police bombing of the home of the radical black liberation anti-police brutality group MOVE that killed six adults and five children and burned down two city blocks. In a major development, Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney announced the resignation of Philadelphia's top health official over new revelations he cremated some of the bombing victims' remains, including bone fragments, without the knowledge or permission of the families. This is the mayor. Health Commissioner Th Dr. Thomas Farley disclosed that several years ago he learned of remains found by the medical examiner's office that belonged to victims of the 1985 MOVE bombing. Instead of fully identifying those remains and returning them to the family, he made a decision to cremate and dispose of them. This action lacked empathy for the victims, their family, and the deep pain that the MOVE bombing has brought to our city for nearly four decades. Philadelphia Mayor Kenny said he demanded the health commissioner's resignation, but put the city's medical examiner, Dr. Sam Galino, on administrative leave because he has civil service protection, unlike Dr. Farley, and because he's needed for the investigation. The mayor met with MOVE family members on Wednesday and agreed to announce the news on the bombing anniversary. He said the amount of remains destroyed without notifying them is not yet known. An investigation will include people approved by the MOVE family. This comes amidst an ongoing investigation into how the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University were in possession of bones thought to belong to one or two moved children killed in the bombing and used them in an online teaching course without the family's knowledge or permission. Meanwhile, on Thursday, MOVE family members and hundreds of supporters hold a memorial and march by the scene of the May 13, 1985, police bombing of their home in Philadelphia, chanting the names of those killed and the lone adult and child survivors. You can see all our interviews about the 1985 MOVE bombing and its aftermath at democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The death toll in Gaza has reached at least 119, and Israel, Israel escalates its aerial assault and fires heavy artillery at the besieged territory. Israel is also threatening to send in ground troops. Israel so far killed at least 31 Palestinian children, many under the age of 10. Gaza authorities report 40 percent of the victims in the Israeli assault have been women and children. Over 830 Palestinians have been wounded so far this week, but Gaza's hospital systems are on the verge of collapse as doctors face shortages of medicine and recurring power outages. The U.N. Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports more than 24 Palestinian schools have also been damaged in the Israeli strikes. Eight people have died in Israel as Hamas continues to fire rockets from Gaza. Israel's rejected calls for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, the United States has blocked the U.N. Security Council from holding a meeting today on the crisis. Earlier in the week, the U.S. twice blocked the Security Council from issuing statements on the violence. On Thursday, President Biden said Israel's actions do not represent a, quote, significant overreaction. 
Meanwhile, Israeli authorities have arrested dozens of Palestinians living in Israel in an attempt to quell an unprecedented uprising. Many are being held without access to legal counsel. Jewish mobs have been filmed attacking Palestinians across Israel, some on live television. Meanwhile, in the West Bank, Al Jazeera reports more than 40 Palestinians have been injured, both by the Israeli military as well as mobs of Jewish settlers. This all comes as Palestinians are planning to mark the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba, or catastrophe, as they call it, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forcibly expelled from their homes after the State of Israel was formed. Later in the program, we'll be joined by two leading Palestinian figures, the historian Rashid Khalidi and the longtime diplomat and politician Hanan Ashrawi. But we begin with the words of Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. She became the first Palestinian-American woman to be elected to Congress in 2018. She spoke Thursday on the floor of the House. I am the only Palestinian American member of Congress now, and my mere existence has disrupted the status quo. I am a so personal for me. I am a reminder to colleagues that Palestinians do indeed exist, that we are human, that we are allowed to dream. We are mothers, daughters, granddaughters. We are justice seekers. An are unapologetically about our fight against oppressions of all forms. And colleagues, Palestinians aren't going anywhere, no matter how much money you send to Israel's apartheid government. If we are, good to, are to make good on our promises to support equal human rights for all, it is our duty to end the apartheid system that for decades has subjected Palestinians to inhumane treatment and racism. Reducing Palestinians to live in utter fear and terror of losing a child, being indefinitely detained or killed because of who they are, and the unequal rights and protections they have under Israeli law. It must end. One of Israel's most prominent human rights organizations, Beth Salem, has declared Israel an apartheid state. Human Rights Watch recently recognized it, too. This is what Palestinians living under Israel's oppression have been telling us for decades. I have been told by some of my colleagues who dispute the truth about segregation, racism, and violence in Israel towards Palestinians that I, that I need to know the history. What they mean, unintentionally or not, is that Palestinians do not have the right to tell the truth about what happened to them during the founding of Israel. They are, in effect, in fact, they erase the truth about ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Israel that some refer to as the Nakba, our catastrophe. As Palestinians talk about our history, know that many of my black neighbors, indigenous communities, may not know what we mean by Nakba, but they do understand what it means to be killed, expelled from your home, land, made homeless, and stripped of your human rights. My ancestors and current family in Palestine deserve the world to hear their history without obstruction. They have a right to be able to explain to the world that they are still suffering, still being dispossessed, still being killed as the world watches and does nothing. As Peter Beinart, an American of Jewish faith, writes, quote, when you tell a people to forget its past, you are not proposing peace. You are proposing extinction. The Palestinian story is that of being made a refugee on the lands you called home. We cannot have an honest conversation about U.S. military support for the Israeli government today without acknowledging that for Palestinians, the catastrophe of displacement and dehumanization in their homeland has been ongoing since 1948. To read the statements from President Biden, Secretary Blinken, General Austin, and leaders of both parties, you'd hardly know Palestinians existed at all. There has been no recognition of the attack on Palestinian families being ripped from their homes in East Jerusalem right now, or home demolitions. No mention of children being detained or murdered. No recognition of a sustained campaign of harassment and terror by Israeli police against worshipers. 
kneeling down and praying and celebrating their holiest days in one of their holiest places. No mention of al being surrounded by violence, tear gas, smoke, while people pray. Can my colleagues imagine if it was their place of worship filled with tear gas? Could you pray as stun grenades were tossed into your holiest place? Above all, there has been absolutely no recognition of Palestinian humanity. If our own State Department can't even bring itself to acknowledge the killing of Palestinian children is wrong, well, I will say it for the millions of Americans who stand with me against the killing of innocent children, no matter their ethnicity or faith. I weep for all the lives lost under the unbearable status quo, every single one, no matter their faith, their background. We all deserve freedom, liberty, peace, and justice, and it should never be denied because of our faith or ethnic background. No child, Palestinian or Israeli, whoever they are, should ever have to worry that death will rain from the sky. How many of my colleagues are willing to say the same, to stand for Palestinian human rights as they do for Israelis? There is a crushing dehumanization to how we talk about this terrible violence. The New York Post reported that Palestinian death roll reported the Palestinian death roll toll as Israeli casualties. ABC says that Israelis are quote killed while Palestinians simply quote die as if by magic, as if they were never human to begin with. Help me understand the math. How many Palestinians have to die for their lives to matter? Life under apartheid strips Palestinians of their human dignity. How would you feel if you had to go through dehumanizing checkpoints two blocks from your own home to go to the doctor or travel across your own land? How would you feel if you had to do it while pregnant in the scorching heat as soldiers with guns controlled your freedom? How would you feel it if you lived in Gaza where your power and water might be out for days or weeks at a time, where you cut, were cut off from your, the outside world by inhumane military blockade? Meanwhile, Palestinians' rights to nonviolent resistance have been curtailed and even criminalized. Our party leaders have spoken forcefully against BDS, calling its proponents anti-Semitic, despite the same tactics being critically critical to ending the South African apartheid mere decades ago. What we are telling Palestinians fighting apartheid is the same thing being told to my black neighbors and Americans throughout that are fighting against police brutality here. There is no form of acceptable resistance to state violence. As long as the message from Washington is that our military support for Israel is unconditional, Netanyahu's extremism Right-wing government will continue to expand settlements, continue to demolish homes, and continue to make the prospects for peace impossible. 330 of my own colleagues, and Democrats and Republicans here, 75 percent of the body here, signed a letter pledging that Israel shall never be made, made to comply with basic human rights laws that other countries that receive our military aid must observe. You know, when I see the images and videos of destruction and death in Palestine, all I hear are the children screaming from pure fear and terror. I want to read something a mother named Iman in Gaza wrote two days ago. She said, quote, tonight I put the kids to sleep in our bedroom so that when we die, we die together. And no one would live to mourn the loss of another one. The statement broke me a little more because of my country's policies and funding will deny this mother's right to see children live, her own children live without fear and to grow old without painful trauma and violence. 
We must condition aid to Israel on compliance with international human rights and end the apartheid. We must, with no hesitation, demand that our country recognize the unconditional support of Israel has enabled the erasure of Palestinian life and the denial of the rights of millions of refugees and emboldens the apartheid policies that Human Rights Watch has detailed thoroughly in their recent report. I stand before you not only as a congresswoman for the beautiful 13 District Strong, but also as a proud daughter of Palestinian immigrants and the granddaughter of a loving Palestinian grandmother living in the occupied Philistine. You take that and you combine it with the fact that I was raised in one of the most beautiful, blackest cities in America, a city where movements for civil rights and social justice are birthed, the city of Detroit. So I can't stand here. I can't stand silent when injustice exists, where the truth is obscured. If there's one thing Detroit instilled in this Palestinian girl from Southwest, it's you always speak truth to power even if your voice shakes. The freedom of Palestinians is connected to the fight against oppression all over the world. Lastly, to my city in Palestine, Ashanik, on a wick of Hannah, I stand here because of you. Thank you. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan speaking on the House floor Thursday. She's the first Palestinian-American woman elected to Congress. When we come back, we'll be joined by two leading Palestinian figures, the historian Rashid Khalidi and the longtime diplomat and politician Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. Stay with us. وين بدك انا نسكن بعرف انه البيت قديم وشايف عيونك حزينه بس انا شو بقدر اعمل قدام الوحش العظيم عم بنحش بطن المدينه وين بدك انا نسكن بعرف انه البيت قديم وشايف عيونك حزينه بس انا شو بقدر اعمل قدام الوحش العظيم عم بنحش بطن المدينه من قال إنه الشوارع رح تضل نفس الإشي من قال إنه المدينة بعد بتنقطع ماشي من قال إنه الحراك بعد لعبتنا البريئة من سرق منا الطبيعة وقلنا حافظوا على البيئة من حط السوق بمول من طلعنا من البيوت من قسمها ومن أجرنا استوديو أصغر من تابوت من أجمل Him to gentrification by Faraj Sulema This is Democracy Now! DemocracyNow.org The Quarantine Report I'm Amy Goodman As we continue Continue to look at Israel's assault on Gaza and the Palestinian uprising. We're joined by two guests. In New York, Rashid Khalidi is Edward Said, professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University. He's the author of several books, including his latest, The Hundred Years' War and Palestine. And in the West Bank city of Ramallah, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi joins us, longtime Palestinian diplomat and scholar, formerly an executive committee member of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the first woman to hold a seat in the highest executive executive body in Palestine. She also served as the official spokesperson of the Palestinian delegation to the Middle East peace process. We welcome both of you back to Democracy Now! Let's begin in Ramallah with Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. Um, on Thursday, the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, put out a one-line tweet, IDF air and ground troops are currently attacking in the Gaza Strip. Can you talk about what's happening there now and the significance of both the attacks there um, and also the mob attacks um, uh, throughout other parts of Israel and the occupied territories? Yeah. Well, what uh, the Israeli occupation forces did was once again target uh, an area that is the most densely populated area in the world, that is under a, a state of siege. They have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. They don't have sirens, they don't have shelters, they don't have uh, air force. Uh, and, uh, of course, they have no protection whatsoever. And uh, they started bombing and shelling uh, by air primarily. And they destroyed three, uh, at first, three major high-rise buildings with uh, residential apartments. And then they continued. This is a pattern that continued. They escalated. They're destroying roads and, and streets, infrastructure, 
uh, electricity and so on, and they're turning life in Gaza, which is already a disaster area, as a result of the siege, uh, turning it into sheer hell. And as you mentioned, there were so many people killed. It's not, I mean, it's difficult for us to talk about statistics. But when I read stories, when I see pictures of whole families, a mother and her three kids, uh, bombed, shelled, uh, destroyed, uh, killed brutally in their own homes, in their own beds, uh, this, is, this is what the reality of living under occupation is, under a state of siege, where Israel has unlicensed, has, has total license to use unbridled power. Uh, to kill and destroy and maim and get away with it, and then you get people like Biden and others uh, say Israel has the right to self-defense. I will repeat something I've said, and I continue to say there is no normality under occupation. This is an ab abnormal situation, and an occupier who is oppressing a whole people cannot claim self-defense if its victims decide to strike back even uh, in a minimal way. It's the, the real issue is the occupation. Now we are seeing, not just in, in Gaza, we are seeing horrific scenes, of course, of death and murder and destruction. We are seeing uh, also in the West Bank, there are protest marches ongoing uh, in every town, city and village. You're seeing in Jerusalem, again, the Israeli border guards, the Israeli security are targeting individuals, they're killing their uh, shooting at Palestinians, they have injured scores of them and uh, arrested many. In, uh, in uh, historic Palestine, in what we call 1948 Palestine, which became Israel, the indigenous Palestinians again are being targeted. They, they are in it. They're being beaten up, actually, by Jewish Israelis because they happen not to be Jewish, because Israel legislated a basic law called the nation-state law in which it says only Jews have the right to self-determination, which meant even Palestinians who were in Palestine before Israel was created, and although they are Israeli citizens, have no rights whatsoever. This is legalized uh, discrimination and apartheid very clearly. So as a result of decades of discrimination and oppression and so on, the the Palestinians in uh, all major areas, cities, towns, and so on, in 48 Palestine, are now protesting because they are facing the violence of the Israeli, ironically, the Israeli settlers who came from the West Bank. It's not enough that they're stealing our land, that they're illegally building uh, colonies and, and settlements in the West Bank. They are fully armed. They are never held to account. And they are always protected by the Israeli army in the West Bank. Now they have been imported, particularly the most extreme racist wing, the Lahava group that has been emboldened by uh, and adopted, actually, by Netanyahu. And they are wreaking havoc within Israel, within what they call the mixed towns and cities, wherever they can find Palestinians, even though they are supposed to have the same passports or nationality as Israelis. They are totally vulnerable. And the Israeli uh, security, the, Netanyahu actually also imported not just the settlers into uh, Israel, but also the border guards, which means he is treating all of historical Palestine like an occupied territory. He's treating Lid, Ramle, Akka, Haifa, Yafa, uh, all these towns and villages as though they are part of an occupied territory, which means Israel is reoccupying uh, Palestine. This is a pattern, but now it has come to a head because now Palestinians everywhere are united in their opposition to oppression, to injustice, to violence, to cruelty and brutality. You have them, as I said, in the West Bank, including Jerusalem, in uh, the Gaza Strip, in, within uh, Israel, 48 Palestine, and all over the world. Now, Palestinians in, in the States, in, in Washington, in uh, Manhattan, New York, in Chicago, in different places, are also protesting along with their allies, along with this amazing solidarity network that is emerging in the U.S., as well as in, in uh, Europe and in the Arab world. So th there is this unity of identity, unity of, of struggle, despite the differences of injustice. 
it's not you can be under occupation you can be suffering also from discrimination and apartheid you can be facing uh, an army you can be suffering exile dispossession and uh, refugee status uh, but you all know that the source of your oppression is the same well, I wanted to bring I want to bring Professor Holiday into this conversation, and he's here in New York. And I, speaking of the United States and its role, I wanted to play a clip of President Joe Biden reiterating his support for Israel's military attack on Gaza, shrugging off concerns over the mounting Palestinian death toll. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have seen thus far is that. Uh, um, there has not been a significant overreaction. Biden did not mention Palestine or Palestinians during Thursday's remarks from the White House. Um, and the Biden administration um, has stopped uh, the United Nations um, on several occasions this week, the Security Council, from taking up a resolution. Can you talk about this, Professor Holliday? Yeah. Uh, well, one wonders what proportion you have to have of Arab deaths, of Palestinian deaths over Israeli deaths. Is it 20 to 1 before the United States finally begins to recognize that this is not legitimate self-defense? We're currently at about 11 to 1, 119 Palestinians killed in Gaza as against nine Israelis. Um, and the biased rhetoric from American leaders, American politicians, continue, uh, continues. Um, I think that I think that this is a perfect illustration of the of the bias that has been a feature of American policy for many many years. Uh, you have in Washington an entrenched view. Um, going back to what Hanan just said and what Representative Tlaib just said, uh, that the Palestinians are less than human, are not important. They don't really count. Um, 31 children have been killed. One Israeli child has been killed. Any child being killed is a tragedy. But that does not penetrate the, the, the consciousness of the politicians who make statements like this, whether the president or the secretary of state or the, or the secretary of defense. And I think it's, it's tragic that a country that claims to be in support of human rights universally should basically consider a whole group of people less human and less entitled to rights. I think that what's happening all over historic Palestine today has brought us back to basics. I mean, it's really tragic that it should have taken this kind of ordeal for everybody, but in particular for Palestinians. But it has brought us back to the understanding that things that were done back in 1948, things that have been done since 1948, whether the occupation of 67 or whether the Nakba of 1948, have echoed and echoed and echoed down to the present. What happened in Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa, what happened in Sheikh Jarrah, What's happening now? Gaza is not just two million people in a strip of land, 356 square miles. These are people who were driven from their homes in 1948 and who have been denied permission to return to those homes and have been stripped of their property by Israeli laws. Nobody talks about this in Washington. Nobody talks about the fact that uh, a, a, a terrible attack on a synagogue, which happened, for example, in Lid a city that Israel is called Lud, um, has been featured in all the American media. The third holiest mosque in Islam, built in the 8th century, has been attacked repeatedly. Stun grenades, tear gas bombs have been fired into the precincts of the mosque as worshippers are praying in Ramadan. I haven't heard a peep out of an American official about this. So we're, we're really talking about something that at the top at least of the American political pyramid, um, in my view, is quite is really quite disgraceful. And I think things are changing at the bottom. I think people are fully aware of the complete iniquity in the, in the way in which the United States deals with this. And I think they're beginning to be aware of the fact that American weapons being used to kill 31 children in Gaza and another 80 people, uh, others, most of them civilians, are being used in violation of U.S. law. The U.S. law dictates that those weapons be used solely for defensive purposes. So when American officials bleat about Israel is engaged in self-defense, what they're doing is not just protecting Israel, they're protecting themselves, because otherwise those arms sales would be illegal, and they would be uh, uh, complicit uh, in illegal actions. So I, I, think, I, I think that it's disgraceful that we should hear such statements. 
But it is really interesting that, that other voices are beginning to be heard uh, in the United States and around the world uh, protesting this. Do you see a difference, Professor Halliday, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, between President Trump and President Biden, in dealing with Israel? Well, of course there are differences, um, but we are, they, they, they play the same tune. They play it in a different register. The Trump administration essentially adopted the most extreme tenets of the most extreme Israeli government in history. Uh, it's a government that intends to create one Jewish supremacy state in the entirety of what they call the land of Israel. Um, that's, the, that's the Netanyahu agenda, and the Trump administration signed on to that completely. Um, this administration, however, uh, is still committed to the same kind of bedrock inequalities um, that every American administration for decades uh, has, has supported, uh, whether this involves not talking about Palestinians at all, as no administration official has done all week, uh, or whether this involves uh, a, a, a kind of, of acceptance of Israeli terms like Israel's security. Israel's security is seen to mandate the killing of 119 people, most of them civilians, a dozen women, 31 children. Um, that kind of thing is, it was shared, that kind of logic, I should say, uh, is shared uh, between all of them, American and American. You, you talk about going back decades. I wanted to go back to 1986, what, like oh. more than 35 years ago, when then Senator Joe Biden talked about U.S. support for Israel, saying if Israel did not exist, the U.S. would have to invent an Israel to defend its interests in the region. This is what he said. If we look at the Middle East, I think it's about time. We stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There is no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. That was... Senator Biden, in 1986, has he changed his view? And talk about what he is saying, Professor Halliday. Well, what he's saying is that Israel operates as a proxy of the United States in the Middle East. And what he's also saying is, vote for me and continue to give me campaign donations. Um, those are—that's uns, unspoken. Um, and that, and the, those, two, those two elements uh, in support for Israel, both in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party, have been constants. Uh, the search for a strategic role for Israel uh, sometimes has gotten pretty desperate because Israel, in fact, harms American interests in many cases in the Middle East. Um, but the pretext, which during the Cold War, uh, Biden was speaking in 86 at the very end of the Cold War, during the Cold War, it could be argued, well, Israel is an American proxy and there are Soviet proxies and so on. Uh, those, those, those feeble uh, pretexts. Uh, for arguing for a strategic uh, role for Israel as, a, as, a, as benefiting the United States. Those have disappeared since the Cold War. Since then, unfortunately, the so-called war on terror has taken that, the place of that. And Israel has managed to merge into American concerns that were sparked by the 9-11 attacks uh, and, and, and the rise of the Islamic State and so forth, uh, in order to sell itself uh, to Americans. Netanyahu was a master salesman in this regard, uh, as a valuable ally in the war on terror. In fact, American support for Israel probably provokes a lot of terrorism. Israeli actions we know uh, provoke resistance. Colonial settler regimes always provoke resistance. If you dispossess people, they're going to resist. Native Americans did the same thing. Uh, 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 Africans facing settler colonialism did the same thing. Palestinians have resisted. And this resistance, coded as terrorism, is then turned into a pretext for uh, uh, arguing that Israel is vital to American interests. Well, if you did not have this settler colonial process of dispossession, which has been going on since 1948, you would not have the resistance and you would not have uh, what is being called uh, terrorism by American politicians. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, can you talk about what you think is going to happen over these next few days, and particularly tomorrow, um, the significance of the day tomorrow, um, as well as these attacks happening during uh, Ramadan and the end of Ramadan? 
Well, of course, it's expected. Tomorrow is the uh, commemoration of al Nakba, in which uh, the date in which Israel was formally uh, formed or created on the land of Palestine, but it's not the beginning of Palestinian suffering, because the Zionist enterprise started way before that, and not just with even with, with the Balfour Declaration of uh, uh, 1912 and so on. There, there has always been an attempt at dispossessing Palestinians, displacing them, and replacing them with another nation. And the extremist Zionist ideology actually gained more and more traction and has been adopted now, till now, in a process of negation uh, of a whole nation, our land, our history, our culture, even our, uh, our very physical presence, our identity, and replacing them, replacing us, with a new narrative, with, uh, a, new, with a new people that came from outside Palestine, at the expense of the Palestinian people, without any kind of... Uh, curbs or engagement or, or uh, accountability. So to the Palestinian people, the date, the Nakba, signals a process. It probably is in the middle of this process, but it is, all, it is always ongoing. And as you have seen in the protests in 48 Palestine, uh, the, the Zionist uh, ideology does seek to displace and replace a whole people. It is not. It is a settler colonial enterprise. It has acted and gained protection as a colonial, a Western colonial outpost. It has been a functional state, let's say, for uh, uh, the remnants of Western colonialism. So, what do you US think <laughs> needs to happen now? I think what needs to happen is to provide two things: Palestinians need protection in accordance with the law and Israel needs accountability in accordance with the law. The problem is it has been emboldened, it has been given license to act with full impunity, it has become the primary source of identification and support. These, these refrains that uh, Rashid talked about were, you know, Israel's right to self-defense, which is absolutely bizarre and unconscionable. Uh, this is one thing, in addition to the fact that the, the pro-Israel lobby, as well as other factors, uh, self-interest in terms of elections and so on, all these things have worked together in, in order to give Israel preferential treatment and immunity to act with full impunity. What needs to be done is to treat Palestinians with full recognition of our rights to freedom, to dignity, to live in our own land, to self-determination, actually, and to start treating Israel as a country governed by international law and humanitarian law. This is one. The U.S., of course, we're not going to expect miraculous transformations. We know that the, the Biden administration has bent over backwards now in order to prevent any kind of in, in intervention or engagement, sending a sort of uh, symbolic, let's say, third, fourth level civil servant does not do anything. <laughs> Had the Amir going to, to Israel or wherever, when, when Netanyahu clearly told the American uh, administration, whether it's the president or, or the secretary of state, that it's none of your business, when they asked him on, to calm down on the issue of Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque and Sheikh, Sheikh Jarrah evictions, he said, we have the right to do whatever we want, and told them very clearly it's none of your business. So you think Hadi Amr is going to come and be listened to? and has uh, or will have the full weight of the office? No. It's clearly just a gesture, a symbolic gesture. And, of course, Biden is looking internally at his own elec uh, elections, at his own party's elections, and he's ignoring a whole body of pe a new conversation in the U.S., the progressives, the minorities, women's movements, LGBTQ, black, everybody is, is out there placing Palestine in the middle of a conversation of rights, of equality, of justice. And within the Democratic Party, they're not just turning a blind eye, they are sort of closing off their ears because they don't want to hear. There are changes now. There's a new conversation, a new language. Palestine is no longer taboo. It is part of the discussion. It is part of the global rights movement. We have allies. And what uh, to add to what Rashid said, this unholy alliance between the U.S. and Israel historically 
has cost the U.S. a great deal, has costed credibility and standing and, 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 and interests and quite often even lives. Because when you have this obsessive support for a country that is creating a situation of extreme abnormality and injustice, and the occupation is in itself an abnormal state, a state of constant aggression, and yet it is getting cover and protection and it is getting emboldened. As we said, during the, the Trump administration, they became a, a party to, they became uh, actually partners in the crime of the Israeli occupation and annexation and, and so on. So th this does not in any way serve American interests. It may serve the interests of individuals who seek to get re-elected on the basis of Palestine bashing and rendering the Palestinians invisible and silenced mm -hmm. and well, amplifying all well. the Israeli voice in a distorted way. But at the same time, the truth is coming out. You On that no note, we have to end it there. But, of course, we'll continue to cover what is happening and developments on the ground in Gaza, in um, the West Bank and in Israel. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, Palestinian diplomat and scholar, uh, speaking to us from Ramallah, and Professor Rashid Khalidi, Edward Said, professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University. We'll link to your op-ed in The Washington Post headlined, What We're Seeing Now is Just the Latest Chapter in Israel's Dispossession of the Palestinians. Now, Next up, we look at how Republican senators are trying to block one of the nation's most prominent voting rights advocates to head the civil rights division at the Justice Department. Stay with us. Light up the world. Oh, wow. Start off your day. Start it off with a smile. Light up the world for all to see. a new day coming where hope is meant to be. Light Up the World by Ruthie Foster. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. As Republican state lawmakers in Georgia, Florida and Texas are passing voter suppression laws, Republican senators in Washington, D.C. are attempting to block one of the nation's most prominent voting rights advocates from a top Justice Department position. In 11 to 11 vote Thursday, the Senate Judiciary Committee deadlocked on whether to move attorney Kristen Clark's nomination for assistant attorney general of the Justice Justice Department's Civil Rights Division to the Senate floor for a full vote. No Republicans voted in her favor. Republican Senator Mike Lee tried to suggest Clark is associated with people who hold anti-Semitic rules, uh, Democrat, uh, anti-Semitic views. Democratic Senator Ron Wyden said, quote, I don't think there's an anti-Semitic bone in Kristen Clark's body. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer can still move to discharge her nomination out of the committee for a debate and floor vote, as he did for Vanita Gupta, who has since been confirmed as Biden's associate attorney general and is the first woman of color and first civil rights lawyer to serve in the position. If Clark's nomination is successful, she would be the first black woman to lead the civil rights division. For more, we're joined by Ben Jealous, president of People for the American Way, former president of the NAACP. Ben, welcome back to Democracy Now! Talk about what needs to happen right now. So the Senate Judiciary Committee deadlocks, but this can still move to the Senate floor, the vote on Kristen Clark to head the civil rights division, can't it? Yes, and that's what Chuck Schumer will have to do. He's just going to have to move this to the floor for a vote. The Republicans are voting on partisan lines, apparently because they're trying to suppress voting rights across the country. And, well, if that's the case, then the last thing you would want is an esteemed voting rights advocate leading the civil rights d division of the U.S. DOJ. So talk about the hearing that took place. Uh, talk about what Kristen Clark represents and why you feel it's so critical um, that she be confirmed. The attacks on her were a new low. We had uh, Senator Cruz accusing her of lying by lying. He pretended that the words of uh, the poet uh, Amiri Baraka were her own words when she had simply forwarded an email with a submission from him to a student magazine, um, just passing it on to her colleagues. He, he then read what uh, 
the poet said and pretended that, that it was Kristen Clark saying that. I mean, that's the type of stuff that we've been dealing with. It's just been lie after lie after lie. I wanted to go to Richard Blumenthal, um, the Democratic senator from Connecticut, um, to immediately responded to the Republican Utah senator Mike Lee's accusation of anti-Semitism. I think, as Merrick Garland said when he was here, I think I know anti-Semitism when I see it. I think yeah. this charge about anti-Semitism is just very regrettably false, even to raise it, is unfortunate. There's no basis for it in the record. In fact, I don't think there's an anti-Semitic bone in Ms. Clark's body, judging by her record. So that's Connecticut Senator um, Blumenthal, uh, who said there's not an anti-Semitic bone in Kristen Clark's body. Uh, we had said it was uh, Senator Wyden before. Um, but to raise that issue, talk about what Kristen Clark represents through the years, what she has done, especially in light of the hundreds of voter suppression bills that are being um, voted on around the country. She's a civil rights lawyers, civil rights lawyer. She has made a name for herself fighting hate crimes, uh, fighting employment discrimination and sexual harassment, and most notably fighting for the right of every person in this country to participate in free and fair elections. Um, in this moment, uh, we're seeing the greatest rise in voter suppression legislation since Jim Crow, which is to say something, because we said the same thing 10 years ago, but this time it's actually worse. And her coming into the U.S. Department of Justice at this moment would really strengthen uh, the hand of the department, which was gutted by Trump, to fight voter suppression across this country. Kristen's one of the most even-tempered, even-handed, most dedicated people to defending the U.S. Constitution that she'll ever meet. And the way that they have lied about her really is a new low. Uh, this is somebody who um, has avoided controversy, if you will, simply by being absolutely decent every day of her life. She doesn't excite easily. Uh, and she, you know, the, one of the things that hurt me most was seeing them trot out the widow of the officer that, Mu that Mumia was uh, convicted of killing to say that Kristen was, was anti-white. It was the craziest thing. Meanwhile, we're sitting there recording video of white women talking about Kristen as their savior on the job because she fought against the sexual harassment and sexual discrimination that they were subjected to for years. There's again, they will just lie, as they call her, a liar. It's 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 really the worst hearing I've seen in a very long time. So uh, we don't have much time left, but the, her position to head the Civil Rights Division, if she is confirmed, not only deals with issues like voting rights, but also consent decrees um, for police departments. Is that right? Yeah, the, the uh, special prosecution of p police officers hand is handled by this office as well. And, you know, you see the U.S. Uh, so you see Republicans in the U.S. right now, their leaders in Congress, apparently very worried that the U.S. Department of Justice under Joe Biden will get back to actually administering justice. And that's why they've been so fierce in trying to stop Ms. Gupta and now Ms. Clark. And we just have 10 seconds. But what do you understand uh, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will do? He will move this to the floor for a vote. He has to. The Republicans quite frankly, are just lying again and again and again and not really doing their job. Ben Jealous, want to thank you for being with us, president of People for the American Way, former president of the NAACP. And that does it for our show. A very happy birthday to Aaron Dooley. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Trina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tamari Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karanani, Masood, Adriano Contreras, and general managers Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Belka Staley. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.